Welcome to the ACS Technical Advisory Board podcast series, where we talk all things tech including data, cyber, AI, blockchain, and Internet of Things. Meet your host, Dr. David Cook, Vice President of the Australian Computer Society's Technical Boards. David is a technology advocate dedicated to advances and progression of computing and human-computer interaction. In today's episode, David will be talking with Karen Cohen, chair of the ACS Blockchain Committee and founder of Women in Emerging Tech. Join us as they discuss blockchain progression, adoption and real-world uses. Karen Cohen is the chair of the Blockchain Technical Committee for the Australian Computer Society. Her block handle is Blockmum. She's the founder and director of the Emerging Tech Hub. She's also the founder of Women in Emerging Tech and she's the Community and Events Manager for Stables. Karen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So let's get into one of the, I guess, the most important questions. What is the most important thing for you in terms of blockchain? The thing that I'm focusing on at the moment is the idea of digital identity. We've all been scammed on these Medicare, cyber losses, uh, Optus. They're all examples of where they've held our data for 10 plus years, why are they holding so much personal information? And this is where if we owned our own identity on the blockchain and we gave out permission for our identity, we would have a lot more control and we would see a lot less cyber issues with these sort of large companies. What do you think has stopped that from progressing? It's been a topic for a while now. It's not a tech issue. We could build it tomorrow. We've built it multiple times on the blockchain. It's an adoption issue. And until we get some adoption from government saying, hey, let's have a, a not only a digital license, but also a license that is permissioned and private, uh, then we will start to see adoption. But until we get uh, adoption with government and support from government, that's not going to happen. Banking the unbanked is a serious problem. Can you explain what it is and what what do we need to solve about that? There's billions of people around the world that just don't have a passport or a license or an ability to start a bank account. So the idea of crypto uh, being able to move across the world, it's cheap, uh, it moves quickly, uh, and you can really do it with uh, less ID. uh, But we've all come to this know your customer situation where you still need a lot of ID to be able to even get a crypto account. So I think... In the beginning, we wanted crypto to be able to bank the unbanked, but that hasn't happened in reality. I guess when it's talking about the uh, know your customer um, uh, model, then there are going to be people from different countries all over the world who are not going to immediately turn to crypto. So part of that adoption that you're talking about, that challenge, is has got to be not just acceptance of the technology, but the cultural understanding that crypto is acceptable to do. And given that, you know, perhaps the association between crypto or Bitcoin and other things, some people just don't feel comfortable with that. What do we say to them? Yeah, look, I think it's going to take time. It's new technology and, you know, we're still used to things like Western Union uh, and those things can still be hacked quite quickly. So until we get used to the idea of quick uh, money that's moving safely across the world, it's going to take time for adoption. Uh, But once you get it, it's so great that I'd be able to send you a Bitcoin in a second. It's like amazing. So let's talk about debanking. It's an increasingly difficult problem for people who are in the, in the industry for blockchain. What do we need to do about this? And does the government have any role to play in this? Yeah, I think crypto is still seen very much as a scammy area. And so the banks um, do like want to manage risk, which is understandable. Uh, but it's not uncommon that if you have an account that's receiving crypto or buying crypto, uh, you'll get a call from a bank and say, your account's closed and we don't really need to tell you why. And that's pretty distressing for any human to have a bank account closed. So yeah, I'm not sure how the government and the banks are going to work together to make sure that we can still have access to regular banking whilst still trading safely. How about blockchain as a as a global um I guess as a global entity, how can it be better managed to make sure that there's diversity and inclusion, you know, worldwide? How can we do that? Well, when I started in 2017, only 5% of crypto buyers were women, and now we've moved to 40%. So there's definitely a huge 
amount of adoption that's changing. I think it's also in the user experience and also the risk appetite. So the user experience, things like having to save 12 or 16 passwords, knowing where to store them under your bed, in a, under your mattress, on a piece of paper, like it just feels overwhelming uh, for a lot of women and older users as well. So the better we can get at the user experience, making it feel like Web 2, but really with an underlying Web 3 security, uh, the more we're going to get adoption, not just from women, but from all different um, diversity and inclusion. I guess when we're talking about the inclusion, particularly if it's the inclusion of women, then is this something which is at the individual level or is it at the corporate level? It's a really good question. I think corporates um, generally will use crypto for things like international payments. Uh, and so, you know, you get this movement of money across the world quickly uh, and cheaply, and then individuals will use it for different reasons. So they might use it for, uh, you know, buying things, like you can get a wallet now, Stables has a wallet, you can tap it, buy your coffee with a Stables wallet, and it feels like a, a totally um, normal Apple Pay or Google Pay, uh, so that helps with adoption. Uh, the other things that, you know, we might want to do is to trade uh, and we might want to save money um, with trading or make money with trading. So it depends on what you're trying to do with the crypto and therefore what the user appetite is. Now, blockchain is a constantly evolving concept. People are jumping on board for different reasons. Where do you think we'll be in, say, five years' time? What's the future of blockchain? Well, I love that when you have a computer and it sort of says Intel inside, then you trust that chip. Where I see it going is that AI, cyber and blockchain are going to work together quite nicely. So you're going to see a little lock that might say this data has been encrypted on the blockchain. You won't care which blockchain it is, but you'll know that that data is secure and it's safe and it's verified and that will make you feel better about the data. And you won't need to know how, just like we don't need to know how is our email coming to us? We want to care about the content of that email in the same way we don't really need to know the goings and innings of, of the blockchain and how it works. We just want to know that we've got good, clean data and it's verified. Karen Cohen, thank you for coming to the podcast. Thanks for having me. To find out more about how the ACS is powering Australia's technology brilliance, visit us at our website, Facebook or LinkedIn. Want to get involved with the ACS technical boards? Email us at tab at acs.org.au and tell us a bit about yourself. Join us for more thought leadership, ideas and information through our other podcasts on the ACS YouTube, Facebook or on LinkedIn.